Hi, I'm Dr. Courtney with the Quantitative Reasoning Center. And this is a map of Blue Mesa Reservoir where my children and I plan on fishing this coming spring and summer. And even though it's January and the fishing season doesn't begin until well, late April or early May, it's probably the first time we could have our boat in the water, uh, we've been busy working now uh, restringing rods, double checking our equipment, and studying maps of where we plan to fish in the spring so that when the time comes we'll, we'll, we're well prepared uh, to give it our best uh, trying to catch lake trout, cocaine salmon, rainbow trout, and brown trout which are the fish that are available in the reservoir. Last year we made every effort in uh, preseason preparation and we did very well. We landed, weighed, and measured over 171 cut bow trout in 11 mile reservoir. So whether it's fishing or a military engagement or preparing for a graded review, uh, careful, consistent preparation over time is an important way to approach the problem. Today we're having a look at 14.8, number 19, and the task at hand is to find the extreme values of the function that we're given uh, on the region. And we need to uh, think about an approach, but I want to remind you that many times for our video, we change the numbers in the problem just a little bit, although the sequence of steps will be exactly the same. So let's think about this region. And uh, this region here is a long, narrow ellipse. Um, and I've actually written this wrong. It's long and narrow the other way because it's going to intercept the y-axis at plus and minus a third and it's going to intercept the x-axis at uh, plus and minus one. So the region uh, is more like this here, so this is the region we're looking at and we need to optimize the function. So the big idea is to use our optimization techniques to find the extrema. Alright, well to, to develop our plan for this we need to recall a few things. Uh, one thing is we need to recall how do we approach finding the minima and the maxima on a given region. Well, there are many approaches available but we need to treat both the interior of the region as well as the boundary. So we want to find the critical points in the interior. And the sub process here is we want to compute partial f, partial x, compute partial f, partial y, set them both equal to zero and solve for x and y critical points. Are we done? No, at this point we'll still have uh, some work ahead of us because now we need to find the critical points on the boundary and to find the critical points on the boundary, we basically have this fu function subject to this constraint. And when you have a function and a constraint, usually the way that you want to proceed is to use Lagrange multipliers. So we're going to use Lagrange multipliers. All right. Well, there's a lot more to using Lagrange multipliers, but uh, we'll go ahead and cover that when we get to it. Let's go ahead and tackle the critical points on the interior. So if f is equal to e to the minus xy, partial f, partial x is going to be negative y, e to the minus xy, and partial f, partial y is going to be minus x, e to the minus xy, where we've used the chain rule in our differentiation. All right, well, when you set this is equal to zero, and this is equal to zero, uh, 
these have a solution when x and y equals zero, so the critical point on the interior turns out to be at the origin. So let's go ahead, a lot of times we need to do some bookkeeping. So our critical points, our first critical point is zero, zero, and the functional value at that critical point, if you substitute in zero and zero, it's just e to the zero, so the functional value is one. All right, well that was kind of the easier part of the problem, and now we need to use Lagrange multipliers to find the critical points on the boundary, and then we'll test all the critical points uh, to see which of the critical points gives us the largest output value. That's going to be the maximum, and we'll find out which critical point gives us the minimum output value, and that's going to be the minimum. All right, so Lagrange multipliers, we need to recall our equation, and we started our execute step here a few minutes ago, and the basic equation for Lagrange multipliers is that the gradient of f is equal to lambda times the gradient of g, and the important thing to remember here is that f, in this case, is the objective function, and g is the constraint function. In other words, if we're going to use this equation, we need to identify our constraint. g, as a function of x and y, is x squared plus 9y squared, and g equals 1 is our constraint. And the way that this unfolds is the gradient of f, this is really a vector equation, so it's 3 equations. 1 says the partial f with respect to x is equal to lambda times the partial g with respect to x. Partial f partial y is equal to lambda partial g partial y. And we really have three equations and three unknowns. And the three unknowns that we're looking for are the critical points x, y, and lambda. So one, one unknown, two unknowns, oops, <laughs> I circled lambda twice. Lambda's only the same unknown two times, but uh, lambda, x, and y are our three unknowns, and we have one, two, three equations. So now it's convenient to head over to the computer and have MATLAB do our heavy lifting from here because we could go forward by hand and with pencil and paper uh, set up this equation, set up this equation and use our constraint, but then we've got lots of equations and lots of unknowns. Uh, it's simply more straightforward and more reliable to have MATLAB uh, set up and solve the problem from this point. Okay, so we have MATLAB up and going, and the first thing we want to enter is we want to define our variables, and we'll hit, do that with the sims command, x, y, and we'll define the variable lambda to be, uh, we'll just call that la, la. And when we go ahead and redo that, when we make them real variables, uh, this will keep any imaginary solutions from showing up because we're not interested in the imaginary solutions. All right, now we can define our function f is just exp of negative x times y. Our constraint function z, uh, I'm sorry, our constraint function g is equal to x squared plus 9 times y squared. Now we have to uh, address the equations with our partial derivatives, so we need to compute the four partial derivatives that show up in our equations, and we'll call the first one df dx, and we'll use the differential function in MATLAB, and we'll differentiate f with respect to x, and now we'll differentiate f with respect to y. Now we'll differentiate g with respect to x. 
and now we'll differentiate g with respect to y. Now it's important to note that this is the function that's computing the derivative and this is just what I'm, I'm naming the uh, functions that end up to be the partial derivatives of each function with respect to each variable and there are four. So now we can go ahead and use the solve command and we want to put the results of the solve command in three MATLAB vectors that we're going to call uh, L, X, and Y. And it's important to list the vectors here in alphabetical order because uh, MATLAB doesn't know that we want to put the solutions to lambda in that vector called L, uh, the solutions to X in that vector, and the solutions to Y in that vector. Uh, MATLAB just knows that we have some variables going to the solve command and it's going to put the solutions into these arrays in alphabetical order so it's important that we number them uh, appropriately. So now we can use the solve command and the arguments of the solve command are the three equations that we wanted to solve and the first is uh, the equation that's partial f partial x minus lambda times partial f partial y is equal to zero but we put in the expression that's equal to zero rather than the whole equation and we actually wanted partial g partial x here because this is the equation that's the x component of the gradient of f with respect to x minus lambda times the gradient of g with respect to x uh, is equal to zero and now we repeat that for the y component and now we repeat the now we have to enter the constraint equation and the constraint equation is g equals 1 so it's g minus 1 is the expression that ends up equal to 0 and now you can see what we have and we'll go ahead and give us some more room and scroll up a little bit here but what we have is we have the solutions uh, in x and y and lambda so there are four solutions uh, of values or, or four points that solve the problem and we have to realize that these are ordered pairs so the square root of 2 over 2 goes with negative the square root of 2 over 6 and so on so we have four ordered pairs that are our critical points and now we need to substitute these back into the original function and let's remember we have our first critical point which was zero so we're substituting into the function f for the variables x and y and we want to substitute in the value first zero zero which is the first critical point and we're expecting that to be one uh, which indeed it is all right, now we can substitute in the second critical point. And to take the element of an array, we want the first element of the array. And if I'm remembering the syntax right, uh, x, the uppercase x, because that's our array. So this expression here is the first element of our array, which that's simply the number that we looked at a moment ago. Uh, right there. So that's what we want to evaluate the function at and we also want the first element of the y array because that's one of our ordered pairs which is our critical point. And sometimes it leaves the a numerical solution kind of in that kind of form and we might want a, a numerical approximation or a number because when we're thinking about mins and maxes, sometimes it's more convenient to have a number. So that way we can or to accomplish that, we simply use the eval, which turns the exact into a decimal approximation. All right, now we just com complete this uh, approach with the other elements.
So what we can see is that the last two ordered pairs in our solution, the third and fourth elements of our arrays, uh, give us the minimum, which is 0.8465, and the first two give us our maximum. So we have found the extrema of the function we were given on the region of interest. Uh, and so let's just go ahead and, and scroll up. So essentially the first two ordered pairs, these two and these two give us our maximum and these two paired with these two give us our minimum and that is our solution to the problem. We had some technical difficulties with the uh, autofocus on the camera uh, when we were filming this section so let's go back over it here. Uh, the first thing we did was we issued a Sims XYZ I'm sorry XY La Real and what this command does is it defines the variables X, Y, and Lambda as real variables. Uh, then we define the function F equals E to the minus X times Y, and that's our objective function. Then we define our constraint function X squared plus 9Y squared, and that's our constraint function G. Then we take our partial derivatives uh, using the differential function of MATLAB and we store them into uh, these function names here. And now the, the key is the execution of the solve command and a couple things are important. Each argument to the solve command needs to be an expression that uh, is one of our equations in, in the unknowns and the expression is what you get when you set the equation equal to zero. So we subtract the lambda times the partial g partial x from the both sides and this is an expression equal to zero. This is an expression equal to zero. And then g minus one is the expression that we get equal to zero from our constraint. And we put the solutions into these three arrays L, X, and Y. And note that we use uppercase uh, characters to represent the arrays and we also we put them in alphabetical order because MATLAB doesn't automatically know that the solutions to LA we want in the L array, the solutions to X we want in the X array and the solutions to Y we want in the Y array. MATLAB just puts them in alphabetical order so we arrange that here. And now now what that command does is that solves the three equations and three unknowns and gives us uh, the solutions and now we can substitute in our critical points because each solution uh, x1, y1, x2, y2 and so on are our critical points. Uh, so we substitute in the critical point in the interior of the region and then we substitute in and the, what the eval command does is that makes MATLAB return a number uh, so that we can see which one's the min and the max. So evaluating the function at all the critical points uh, shows us which one of the critical points are the minimums and which one are the maximums. So this is a nice summary of how we use MATLAB to do the heavy lifting once we've set up the problem.